Hello, this video is about a modified form of problem 3.2.30a, a star problem in Broverman. A differential equation for the outstanding balance on a loan, where we're paying it back with a continuous payment stream, so that's kind of general. But we do think keep things a little simpler with the force of interest, or we're still going to have a constant force of interest. This is going to be one of my longest, most abstract videos in this series, but it's really important. I hope you... Uh, try to watch it anyway and take notes and pause it. Lots of good information, but it is abstract. It's going to be difficult and long, but stick with it, okay? So here it is. I've modified it from the book. A loan of amount L at interest rate I per period, that's constant, and has equivalent force of interest delta, delta would be the natural log of 1 plus I, is repaid by means of continuous payment for n periods with rate of payments k sub t at time t. In the last video, we did a rate of payment as well, a continuous payment stream, but it was a constant payment stream. In this video, it's varying. It's a function of t. In order, It can't be an arbitrary payment stream. In order to pay off the loan by time n, this equation does need to be true. I'll explain this equation in a few minutes. Part one, formulate a prospective and retrospective outstanding balance at time t. Find a formula for the outstanding balance at time t and verify that it satisfies this differential equation right here. Now, before I go on, this differential equation should make intuitive sense. In fact, you should be able to derive it without doing fancy math like we're going to do in this video. Think about it. You take out a loan. Pretend you don't pay it back at all. Kt is zero then the balance is going to grow according to this differential equation. Its rate of change will be proportional to itself. The bigger it is, the faster it grows. Delta is going to be the constant of proportionality. It's going to be the relative rate of growth. When you've got a payment stream, say in dollars per year, for example, you are subtracting that off. It, the units match dollars per year on both sides, and you are subtracting that off from the overall rate of change of the function. So this equation should make sense even without doing the math we're about to do. It also, by the way, could be applied in other situations like where you're saving money in a savings account and you're also making withdrawals that are in a continuous withdrawal stream. The same differential equation would hold, so it's a good general fact to know. Second part of the problem is to do a special case, assuming kt is constant, um, then the formula for the outstanding balance can be simplified to this. We're going to use knowledge about solving differential equations to do this. That is the same equation we derived in video number 77 related to exercise 3.2.25. That's the last video. All right, but let's now go and talk about where this equation comes from. Here's your time axis, and here's your arbitrary continuous payment stream. As a function of time, we go from time 0 to time n. Initially here to derive this formula, let's imagine a moment in time s, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, between 0 and n. And also imagine a tiny amount of time elapsed, call it ds. So ds is going to be a tiny amount of time that elapses starting at time s. Is it an infinitesimally tiny amount of time? Well, you could pretend it is, even though there are no such things as infinitesimally small positive number in numbers in the standard real number system, but it's helpful to pretend. And it's helpful to pretend you take ks times ds to get the uh, nominal payment during this tiny interval of time. We want to relate that to the loan balance. If I add up all the tiny payments and discount them all to time zero, that should be the same as the loan amount. This tiny payment discounted to time zero needs to be multiplied by the discount factor of v to the s power to find its present value at time zero. And then to find all the present values of the entire payment stream combined, we have to add them all up. We have to integrate them. That's the idea intuitively of what the integral is. All right, with that background, let's now approach part one. And let's do it with the retrospective method first for the outstanding balance as a function of time. We did that in the last video. Uh, we'll do it here first in this video. We will do the prospective method too. For the retrospective method, looking back in time, you take the loan amount at time zero and promote it forward in time to time s, or to time t here actually now because t is going to be the variable. Let's pretend s is less than t. So I take the loan amount and promote it forward in time to time t by multiplying by one plus i to the t. 
and you also have to subtract off the accumulated value of all the payments to that point. Um, if I take this pay tiny payment over this tiny interval of time and promote it to time t, I need to multiply ks by 1 plus i to the t minus s. That distance there is t minus s. ds, that would be the accumulated value of this tiny payment at time s valued at time t. I'm doing that for all the payments between time 0 and time t, so I need to do this integral from 0 to t. And that is one form of the retrospective, for retrospective formula. You also could write it in terms of e and delta. 1 plus i is e to the delta, so this can be written as l times e to the delta times t power. And in the integral, we can write 1 plus i to the t minus s as e to the delta times in parentheses t minus s. Now let's do the prospective. These formulas do give you the same thing, by the way, in case that wasn't clear. For the prospective method, now we are looking forward in time. We are looking at the future payments after time t. We need to discount them back to time t. Now what, let's pretend s is between t and n. This product still represents the, well, OK, ks times ds still represents the nominal amount of the payment over a tiny interval of time starting at time s. I need to discount that back to time t. I need to multiply by v to the s minus t. So v to the s minus t times ks ds is the discounted value at time t of this tiny payment at over the tiny interval of time ds. If I want to find the uh, present value at time t of all those payments, I need to add them up. I need to integrate as s varies between t and n. So this is the formula you get with the prospective method. Um, I'm going to differentiate this one to do the second part of part one here. And I'm going to find it helpful to rearrange the order of the n and the t. And I can compensate for that by putting a negative sign in front of it here. And let me also use e here. Let me write a k sub s. And then v is e to the negative delta. So I can write v to the s minus t as e to the negative delta times in parentheses s minus t. There's another way to write it. I'm going to write it one more way. By properties of exponents, after factoring, uh, distributing the negative delta through here, I can write this as uh, e to the positive delta t times e to the negative delta s. And, oh, that would, excuse me, this integral is with respect to s. Since this part doesn't involve an s, I can factor it out. I can write this as negative e to the delta t times the integral from n to t ks times e to the negative delta s ds. That should be a ds here. OK. Now to do the differential equation, let's differentiate this thing here. The derivative of the outstanding balance as a function of time. Bring the negative sign out in front. And inside here, I have the product of two functions of t. So I need to use the product rule. The derivative of the first function by the chain rule is delta e to the delta t. Multiply that by the second function, which is the integral. By the way, I can't do this integral because I don't know what ks is. And then add on the first function. I forgot my minus sign in front here, too. Add on the first function e to the delta t times the derivative of the integral. And again, you don't know what ks is, so you have to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, really, to say the derivative of an integral like this is really the integrand with a t in place of the s. kt e to the negative delta t. with the negative sign out in front. OK, um, what am I trying to do with this? I'm trying to show this equals delta times the outstanding balance minus kt. I can distribute the minus sign through. This certainly simplifies to kt right here. 
these e to the delta t and e to the negative delta t cancel to, to 1. And I can, after distributing, distributing the minus sign through, I can rearrange the integral order if I like. Actually, I don't have to. I can just write it like this. Delta times negative e to the delta t times the integral ks e to the negative delta s ds and then minus kt and this thing right here is obt it's the same as this okay so now i've verified that it satisfies the differential equation okay so that's part one but again you should be able to make sense and even derive this differential equation without doing all this okay that's what I talked about at the beginning. All right, now what about part two? Assuming that we've got a constant function of t, it has to be this particular function to pay off the loan by time n. Um, show that OBT can be written this way, using knowledge about differential equations. Now, there's a couple ways to solve a differential equation like this. And let me just call the function b instead of ob. Let me write the differential equation like this. Uh, and kt is a constant function here. Again, it's this thing up here, l times delta over 1 minus v to the n. There's a couple ways of solving a differential equation like this. One essentially involves some guessing, uh, considering what's called the corresponding homogeneous equation where you get rid of that, that part and finding its general solution, then guessing a particular solution to this. But I instead want to do something called the method of integrating factors, because that's a method that um, applies more generally, even though it might be harder in some situations. So let me rewrite the differential equation by subtracting delta b from both sides. And this thing on the right is just a constant. Okay. That's a constant function of t. The method of integrating factors says create a new function, call it, it's typically called mu, to be e to the integral of whatever the coefficient of b is here. It's a constant coefficient in this case. It doesn't have to be constant. This becomes e to the negative delta t. And multiply both sides of the differential equation by this integrating factor, so it becomes a factor of both sides. It's called an integrating factor because it's going to make the left-hand side easy to integrate, and the right-hand side is not going to be too bad either. I can write the differential equation after multiplication as e to the negative delta t dB dt minus delta e to the negative delta t times b equals negative L delta over 1 minus V to the N times E to the negative delta T. The left-hand side doesn't look easy to integrate, but actually it is because you realize from the product rule that it's the derivative of E to the negative delta T times the function B. B is a function of T here. You could put an of T here if you like. It's the derivative of that function, so integrating it gives you that function. And the right-hand side is not too hard to integrate either. Go ahead and do it. So we integrate both sides. Integrate. We get e to the negative delta t times b of t equals the integral of this thing. You're going to get a negative 1 over delta involved. It's going to cancel with a negative delta here. You'll get L over 1 minus v to the n, e to the negative delta t, plus a constant of integration. Solve for b now by multiplying both sides by e to the positive delta t. e to the positive delta t cancels with this to give a 1. I get L over 1 minus v to the n. And then I get a plus c e to the delta t. There is your general solution of this differential equation. But we also want to satisfy this initial condition up here. The outstanding balance at time 0 should be L. b of 0 should equal L. L equals B of 0. When I plug in 0 in for T here, I get just a 1. E to the 0 is 1. I get a C times 1 is C. This becomes L over 1 minus V to the N plus C. And I want to solve for C. C is L minus 
L over 1 minus V to the N, which if you get a common denominator becomes this, which simplifies to negative V to the N over 1 minus V to the N, as it should, uh, if you look up here, there it is, in front of the E to the positive delta T. The final answer here for B of T, which is the same as OB sub T for our problem, is this thing, L over 1 minus V to the N, time, or plus this thing times E to the delta T, which is the same thing as what I have up here, just switched around the order. Okay, so we have verified using this method of integrating factors that the function simplifies to this in the case where uh, the payment stream is level, a constant payment stream of this level, that amount of money per unit time. Thanks for sticking with me. That's the end of this video. I was too hasty in saying that's the end of the video. I wanted to say one more thing quick, and that is in the next video, or perhaps even two videos, I'm going to use this differential equation and solve it in more complicated contexts uh, to show you how to deal with those more complicated contexts, so this differential equation with this initial condition, but a different KT function.